Hello, welcome to the Tiger Sports Report Basketball Pod here in Memphis Rivals. I am Devin Latulip, your host. I'm joined by my co-host, Sam Shoemaker. Devin, first episode. I'm happy to be here. How are you? I'm great, man. It's a great day to be alive. I'm also joined by my two close friends, Landon Speck. Devin, what's up? How you doing? I'm great, man. Glad you're here. And Noah's Andy. Hello. How you guys doing? Great. Glad you're here, man. So pretty much what we're going to run down is we're going to start off with the Missouri game. The first game of the season, they were victorious by a score of 83-75. to 75. Leading score was P.J. Haggerty with 25 points. Um, Sam, what were your thoughts of the game? How'd you like how the boys look? What were your likes, dislikes? Go ahead. I mean, in the first half, obviously, we all saw what happened. Like, you, Memphis played a more stagnant, let them come to us style of basketball. But then in the second half, they turned it up. Penny told them, you have to go at them. And then they started they started pressing the press. That was the first time in a while I've seen for a Memphis basketball game that the press actually helped them win the game. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, of course, second half, P.J. Haggerty, I think he had, what, four points in the first half, and then he finished with 25. Yeah, I believe it was three. Three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he finished the game with 25 points. And, and not to... Not to discredit everyone else, but right now we've seen we've seen PJ Haggerty play three games in the Tigers uniform. Only one of them was real, right? But it was like a get PJ Haggerty the ball and get the hell out the way type of thing, right? Sure. And uh, and another thing that I really liked was Baraka Koji. He came in. His stats weren't incredible. I don't have them right in front of me, but I know he as far as box score stats, he didn't do anything crazy. But he really was. Uh, he had five fouls. He fouled out, but he was really helped turn that game around with the intensity that Memphis needed. I agree. I think Akoje was a big part of that game, honestly. And it, like you said, it doesn't sell up on the stat. I mean, stats. He finished with two points, four rebounds, and fouled out. But his energy on the court, especially during the press, was something that was just really desperately needed by the Tigers in the second half. Um, another area of interest for the Tigers was Tyrese Hunter, the uh, guard there. He now, from my understanding, he is a big leader in the locker room. He said in the post-game interview that he gave a halftime speech that kind of ignited the Tigers around him. Because I believe they would they go into halftime, they were down. They were down by at least double digits going in half, and they needed a spark. They were booed into the locker room, and Tyree Center kind of provided that. Uh, Landon, what were your thoughts on the Missouri game? Well, obviously in the first half, uh, Memphis failed to do one thing that's kind of important when it comes to winning basketball games, and that's make shots. It's usually pretty important. In the second half, they came out. They they ended up knocking down some threes. Um, finished the game shooting 40% from three as a team. Uh, a lot of that was P.J. Carter off the bench, transfer, went three for six. Uh, P.J. Haggerty had had the one, and Haggerty's an interesting one because he actually shot under 30% from three at Tulsa last season, so that's probably a big emphasis of his is getting getting that three-point percentage up. Tyrese Hunter got you a few. Colby Rogers got you a few as normal. So I think that may have had something to do with the momentum of the game, too, going back on what y'all said about the press. They started really speeding Missouri up, and – I think once you a good defense turns into offense, it's kind of a cliche at this point, but it really is true. It, I think that probably pushed the momentum into them knocking down some shots and, and pulling away late in that game in the second half. Yeah, for sure. The uh, you know what I was surprised about, honestly. I mean, like we said, the two exhibition games aren't exactly you know you can't judge the team based off those. But I, what I was concerned about in the two exhibition was the ball movement. I thought it was really stagnant. I thought we weren't getting guys open shots. I thought we were missing guys a lot. I was really impressed with how with how United the offense looked in the second half. Uh, we were finding guys were making the extra pass, finding guys in the corner, uh, bounce pass to the middle, you know, middle of the floor. I was really impressed with that, um, especially from P.J. Haggerty. I think he has really good control of the court. Now, Noah, what were your thoughts of the game, and what did you like about what Memphis did? <clears throat> in the first half, I think Memphis looked like how a new team would look with a bunch of players that just came in. I think they were pretty confused on where the ball was going half the time, and they needed someone to really direct the offense because they were getting drives down to the baseline and they were just kind of sitting there. It caused a lot of turnovers. In the second half, I think when Haggerty started to take over, the entire offense just followed and there was a lot more of a, a flow. And then you could even see it in the, like the uh, crowd's reaction. The crowd was getting into it. And usually in these Memphis games, Memphis makes a little bit of a run, takes the lead, and they start to let the other team back in, whoever it is. And you didn't see that this game. I think once Memphis took over, it was the game was over. Yeah, for sure. It definitely it definitely did feel like the opposite of last year. Because what we saw a lot last year was Memphis would, you know, get off hot. David Jones would get going. They'd be up, you know, t what fifteen double double digits at halftime. Then the other team would slowly creep back in second half, and we'd have a really close game down to the wire. And it was just it was just not 
you know, it's not conducive to winning basketball to allow teams to hang in. What I did like about this team, like you mentioned, was how they started down, faced adversity early, and then came back and won the game, got it done. They actually, I don't believe they trailed much after the 10 minute mark of the second half. I believe they took the lead and, and made a run to get back up. Um, go ahead, Sam. Yeah. Um, another thing is I, you're talking about how first half Memphis let things come to them, second half they made stuff happen, right? And, and that is the winning formula for Penny Hardaway basketball teams, and right. especially this Memphis team, with Tyreek Smith leaving, we all know what happened there. And then you only have three three bigs on your entire roster. Another thing is you only have nine scholarship players healthy and eligible to go right now, right? You have, it depend, you know, Bona Kibe, he's maybe get a red shirt, he's injured right now, he would be your 10th guy. You only have nine healthy players and then that are not walk-ons, and then Nick Jordan, Colby Rogers, and Baraka Koji all fouled out, right? So, so playing fast and going at the opposition is how Memphis is going to win games. But when you only have if three people foul out, if you only have six players, you can't you can't sustain that for forty minutes of a basketball game. So that's going to be interesting to see going forward for me. Absolutely, yes. Nick Jordan picked up three quick fouls in this game against Missouri. I believe it was all within the first. I believe it was for the twelve minute mark. He had three fouls and sat on the bench the rest of the first half. Uh, I am a Nick Jordan is very important to this defense, like you saw, because he checked back in the second half. Every the energy shifted. It felt like guys knew where to go more. You know, I, I don't know that he's necessarily like communicating and leading on the court, but I think his mere presence is enough to you know situate the defense and get everybody standard. Speaking of the bigs, Musa Cisse, Musa Cisse and Dane Danger also had great games. Musa Cisse finished with 14 points. Danger was six and seven re- or uh, excuse me, eight rebounds. And even though those stats don't show up and pop out of the page. They were very, very important in this game, protecting the paint. Uh, so <clears throat> last year, free throw shooting was a problem for this team, big time. Felt like every time an important game, close game, we'd have you know shot below 75% from the free throw line. This is going to be finished shooting 79.3, and P.J. Haggerty finished 10 for 11, was a CSA, 6 for 10. Besides that, we're not getting to the foul line a whole bunch, but we did shoot far better from the three-point line, 40%. Now, Landon. In your opinion, who is the second star on the Tigers offense? When P.J. Haggerty is off the court, who's leading? Who's going to get a bucket when we need one? I think it's going to have to be Tyrese Hunter. He's played a lot of big-time college basketball in a big-time conference. I think that's the, the biggest difference between this trio of guards. Penny went and got out of the portal with Hunter, Haggerty, and Colby Rogers. Hunter, or, excuse me, Colby Rogers and Haggerty, they were both in the American Athletic Conference last season, same conference right now. Tyrese Hunter comes over from the Big 12. He's played in big games. He's played at, against, at the highest level of competition in, in college basketball. And he's definitely capable of staying poised and, and getting in there and going get, going and get you some buckets when he needs to. I think he's definitely would be the second guy you look to if Haggerty just doesn't have it or gets in foul trouble, whatever it is with him. Absolutely, I agree with you. And I think it's also important for um, Colby Rogers, who's our kind of shooter, uh, spot up guy. He fouls the shot two of five from three from the beginning. Um, I was impressed by what I saw from him, and I think he's has a big role in this offense. Now, Sam, you mentioned that the most the most efficient way Memphis can play basketball is to run, run the court, play aggressive defense. But like you mentioned, also we don't have enough players to be fouling out three guys in this game. So now I'll ask you, what is the key to Memphis being able to play the style of basketball they want to play, and how efficiently do you think they can do that with this limited roster? I think the uh, need to kind of pick their spots with their aggressive defense. I think when you saw them start to get on a run here, I think the um, the full court press was a good idea, just forcing turnovers because they, they were needed in a game where you were down double digits at half. I, um, I also think that the uh, silly fouls started to come back a little bit. There was a couple, I think the officiating in this game actually was pretty questionable. The, uh, we weren't getting many calls, but so, some of the fouls that we take, I just think we cannot take. But for the most part, I think we did a pretty decent job, just given that it's the first game, and that's the kind of defense we're running. Some guys might be new to that. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I will say, you know, kind of the first game vibes here. The assist to turnover ratio. Now, Memphis turned the ball over 16 times in this game to, I believe it was... 16 assists. 16 assists, yes, sir. So, but, you know, and that doesn't look good on the stat sheet, obviously. 
I believe watching the game, it felt like the ball movement was, I feel like 16 assists doesn't do the ball movement justice. I thought that we moved the ball well, especially in the second half, like we said, kind of united the team in the second half there with the ball movement. But 16 turnovers is definitely still too high no matter how many assists you have. So how do we, how do we turn, how do we get that number lower? Who's got to be, uh, PJ Haggerty had five turnovers, and Tyrese Hunter had four, but those are the main ball handlers. So where are we, you know, where do we improve? How do we get these silly turnovers to stop? Because it did feel like a lot of them was missed passes that just got tipped out of bounds or something like that. So that's something to keep an eye on for sure. I'm um, getting that turnover number down. And that was a problem big time last year was it just felt like no matter how many assists we had, no matter how good we looked, it was, you know, we had multiple guys on the roster with, you know, four plus turnovers. So that's an important part of getting that down. Um, looking at this game, what is one thing you want Memphis to take away and improve on for this game against UNLV on Saturday? And we'll start with you, Lynn. I think, obviously, you don't want to come out as flat in the first half. I do think a lot of that had to do with the fact that you you obviously just built a brand new roster and they're all together. Uh, I think <clears throat> Jordan getting in foul trouble early, I think, was a big deal. Uh, we kind of hit on it earlier, but losing Tyreek Smith, who you were counting on to play a lot of minutes and be your backup for, it puts a lot more pressure on Jordan. And with only three front court players, it's pretty essential that he stays in the game. So uh, I think from an individual standpoint, just Jordan staying in the game. And then as a team, obviously you don't want to dig yourself in as big of a hole as you did early. So I think coming out, applying the pressure defensively, getting ahead, and making them play from behind and essentially having to play a, a perfect game for most of the game to try and get back in, I think. That should be the goal here for the Tigers. Same guy. I asked Penny after the game uh, what he thought of the half-court offense. He said, you know, there were some good things to take away, but there was definitely a lot more negative than positive. And, you know, we talked about that's how Memphis is going to win games. They're not going to win games in the half-court. They're going to win games turning defense into offense, right? But I'm, I'm really interested to see how this half-court offense looks against – you know, we're, we'll get into it more later, but against a UNLV team that did not look great defensively, right? So you will have a chance to, you only have your nine players, right? you have a chance to slow things down, to not get into foul trouble, to not force silly turnovers. I'm really interested to see how this half-court offense looks going forward. For sure. No, go ahead. Uh, kind of adding on to what Landon said, I think you want to take the second half we had and say, guys, we can carry this into the first half so we don't have, we're not in this position again. I think um, you can see Haggerty start, start to like orchestrate the offense more. We're gonna have a lot of scoring opportunities in this one, and just some of the uh, taking away some of the turnovers. A lot of the turnovers came off of just I think almost momentum plays to where you're trying to create a big play, and the smarter play is just to hold. And a lot of it was down low too. A lot of uh, force passes down low. So I think if we cut that out, keep, keep this energy rolling from the second half, I think it should be a pretty good result for Memphis. Yeah, I would say I, I I agree with all three of you guys. I think everybody had made excellent points. I'd like to see Memphis start off with that aggressiveness they had in the second half. Um, and not, I don't know if we have to full court press from the beginning of the game, but I would like to see try to you know play tight defense, even if we had to pick up some fouls. If we create those turnovers and get off to a big lead, uh, we need to we need to blow UNLV out. I don't want a close game. I don't want to let them hang around. We have we have the ability to go up big in this in this game in the first half, and I think we should take advantage of that. Okay, before we move on to the UNLV game, does anyone have any more notes about this Missouri game? No, sir. All right, very good. So, as we know, Memphis will play UNLV on Saturday, 5 o'clock on the Mountain West Network. Now, UNLV, they are led by their leading scorer, Bear Cherry, Jeremiah Cherry, they call him Bear Cherry. He is a, he's a player. He's a um, physical guy down the paint. It will provide a challenge for Dane Danger and Cisse and Jordan. Um, he's a he's a big guy. He averaged in that first game against Alabama State, scored 24 points, grabbed 11 rebounds, and their ball handler is Deaton Thomas Jr., who they refer to as DJ. Um, he's a sophomore. Uh, he's he's a guy. He can uh, he can pass the ball well. He can shoot well. Average 17 points. Um, I will say, you know, the one and zero Alabama State. They gave up. I believe it was 70, 79 against a questionable Alabama State offense. So I, you know, would like to see Memphis put up some good points here. Now, 
What do we think is the key to this game? I would say the key is get out early, get up big, don't allow you know, V any any opportunity to stay in this game. Get up early. Um, we we do need to key in on on Bear Cherry, who you know the forward for UNLV. He is he he's he's a guy. We got to key in early on him. Don't let him dominate the paint because that can be a big struggle for the Tigers. Um, yes. So I like I said, don't let Bear Cherry dominate. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited for this opportunity for Musa in this game because mm-hmm. Jeremiah Cherry he's six eleven two eighty so he's a big fella. Um, he's a JUCO transfer. This is his first year in Division One basketball, and Moose has been playing Division One basketball for like what? This is his sixth year, fifth year. I'm not sure. It, he has so much experience, and and Bear Cherry obviously doesn't. So I'm really excited to see what Musa can do with this opportunity. Um, you talked about it. Cherry had 24 and 11, but what was impressive was he did it on 90 percent shooting. He missed one mm-hmm. shot. He went 10 of 11 from the field, and it wasn't like. He's not a free throw merchant, so he wasn't. <laughs> right. uh, he was doing it just on post moves, back to the basket, just really impressive stuff that you like to see from a college player that you just really don't see too too often. Absolutely. Now, <clears throat> Landon, what would you like to? See? What is the key to Memphis in this game? How do they? How do they assert their dominance? How do they run out? How do they win this game? You know, I think they play how they want to play. They want to apply pressure on defense. They want to turn you over, and they want to score in transition. Uh, Obviously, the half-court offense isn't going to be the strength of this team, so I think you got to play in the full court, which requires turning them over defensively. I think another thing is, go, I mean, this this will probably end up being a story all season. It's just the front court depth. you got three players. I think another thing with Jordan, too, as good as he is defensively, I think he he's an elite glue guy. So I think mm-hmm. when, when you get erratic on offense, things aren't flowing, maybe you're turning the ball over a whole lot, I think he's almost like a tight end in football. He's just a perfect safety net to get in there. And obviously, when he's in foul trouble, you don't have that. So I think the uh, the play of the front court and just staying on all three of those guys staying on the floor is going to be a big deal in this game. And Memphis just playing the style that they want to play. Absolutely. And I'll ask you, how does Memphis win this game? I think it's gonna the key is going to be just plugging up the middle. I think you want to make their guards beat you. We have a lot of experience at guards, so I don't really have a problem with our guys going one on one with theirs. It just we cannot get dominated in the paint, and a lot of that is staying out of foul trouble. You cannot, you cannot be fouling out early. We have to, um, we have to keep. I would agree, keep a full uh, court press going the entire time, make them run, and uh, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one thing I would like to see, absolutely, is PJ Haggerty get off to a strong start in the first half. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, he finished with three first half points against Missouri, and. You know, I understand he's a point guard, so he needs to get the team involved. He needs to get the <clears throat> offense initiated. He is at his most valuable when he's going to the paint, finishing or getting fouled, shooting free throws. What that does is it makes the defense collapse. It opens up the wings for Colby Rogers, uh, PJ Carter, Tyce Hunter, get open shots for his teammates. And I do think that's one of the reasons Memphis struggled in the first half against Missouri was PJ Harry was not aggressive enough. And then you saw in the second half when he started to play more like his regular self, things opened up on the offense, guys got going. So, <clears throat> with that being said, in this UNLV game, I'd like to see P.J. Haggerty score at least double-digit points in the first half. <clears throat> now, I'll ask the table here. Who is the key? Who's the key guy in this game? Who's the guy that if they don't have a good game, Memphis might be looking at a closer game than we can expect? Um, I'm I'm expecting a big game from Colby Rogers here, especially with I don't think uh, UNLV's defensive like gap schemes. I don't think I think Haggerty's going to be able to drive when he wants to, and then Hunter and then our guards going to be able to drive when they want to, which will create get to the middle and kick it out right. So I'm expecting a lot of a lot of open shots for you know PJ Carter and Colby Rogers. So they're going to have to knock those down. They knocked them down pretty well in the uh, Missouri game, eight of twenty, which is forty percent. You can't really expect too much more, so I think you'll need you'll need to knock down your open shots, but you'll definitely get them. So, Landon, go. Uh, it's yeah, kind of the same thing to that. I think Haggerty's going to get so much attention as a scorer. I think he's going to have an excellent chance to be a playmaker in this game, and I think a part of that could be like you said, getting off to a good start in the first half, whereas they'll have to start keying in on him in the second, and he can start making plays for others. I, I think that's a much much better way to live as a point guard rather than 
the way he kind of played in the first game where he had to kind of be superhero in the second half. I think he'd much rather get get going early and then you can disperse out to your teammates later in the game. So, yeah, I think Hunter and Rodgers, just as the other two guards hitting open shots, is, is going to be the key. So, yeah, if Memphis struggles shooting the ball, they could they could serve issues for them in this game. No, you can go ahead. I'm going to say – I'm actually going to go too. I'm going to say Cisse and Jordan. I think, I mean, the, the way you win this is you stop Air Cherry. I think UNLV doesn't really have a shot in this one. If they can get, play good defense down low, make him kick it out, no easy shots, stay out of the foul trouble, I think um, that's going to be the key. And I'd like to see Jordan get a little bit more incorporated offensively. Maybe if he can get like 10 points or so. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I'd like to see Jordan be more involved offensively. Uh, especially because he can shoot the three. I mean, his number, he shot, he didn't miss a, excuse me, he didn't make a three, Missouri. He does have the ability to shoot. He's not the most efficient or best shooter on the team, but he can definitely spread the court out and shoot. Okay, before we wrap up here, let's get into predictions. I believe that Memphis will win this game by double digits. Probably around the same score of Missouri. I imagine we score 80 points. Probably, I'm going to say we probably score 87. I'd like to see us hold UNLV to under 65 points. I believe we are definitely able to do that. And I'll get the predictions around the table, so we'll start off with Sam. Um, I think it's going to be more of like a, a slower game. I know Memphis needs to to push the ball to really blow these guys out, but I think they're going to want to under. I think they're going to understand that they don't really have the depth to do that for forty minutes every game. I think I'm kind of going more like Memphis sixty five. I think UNLV hangs around the whole game, but the Memphis maybe gets like sixty eight. UNLV sits it. 57 around there. So I'll say 68, 57 Memphis. will be a close one until Memphis pulls away at the end. All right, Lynn, what do you got? I'll go Memphis 72-61. I think it could kind of be a middle ground between the scoring and that Missouri game. And then, as Sam talked about, with the with the lower scoring, it definitely wouldn't surprise me. Um, you know, with college basketball, it can get it can get a little unpredictable. I think there's a lot of variance just because of the shooting and the, and the shot making compared, especially to the NBA. But I think with this game, you got to think too. Memphis is traveling all the way out to Vegas. You know, mm-hmm. those road trips could could get a little bit tricky. We haven't really talked about that much, but yeah, we we'll see how they handle that part of it. So yeah, I think Memphis has a chance to get out of here with the with a good win. All right, I'll go. You know, I'm gonna say 75-67 Memphis. I think the score is gonna look a little closer than what the game will end up actually being. I can see UNLV start to, I I have to imagine they're going to get up for this one. It should be a big big game for them, but I think Memphis is just the better overall team. All right, there you have it. My score was much higher than everybody else's, so we'll see what the uh, final (laughs) result is. Um, Yeah, I just imagine Memphis will run the floor, get the guys going, get up early. That's what I would hope for this game. We'll see how it goes. Well, that's going to wrap us up today. Thank you for listening to the Target Sports Report podcast. And we will catch you next week.